Hello friends, my name is Raymond Livingston. I'm a lifelong hunter, a conservationist, a spiritual badass, a forest sage in training. I'm one who prides himself on having a strong connection to the natural world. I'm making this video as a uh, statement of direction and intent to the board members of the Oregon Outdoor Council, but also for the rest of the world as well. As a, <clears throat> as a lifelong hunter that also has a strong spiritual connection with the natural world, I kind of look at all that's going on politically as it concerns hunting and fishing, and I'm just perplexed. It seems like there are these opposing sides that spend all their time arguing and trying to win without truly having an understanding of what they're trying to win and the, the full ramifications of what they're fighting for. In Oregon, for instance, we have an initiative that's going forth that is trying to ban all hunting, farming, anything that might uh, might end with uh, any type of life being taken. You know, a complete lifestyle switch for the entire state to something that's unrealistic and unhealthy. In Washington, and in several states, our Fish and Game Commissions have been taken over by people with their own agendas. They're discarding the science, the good science that their own organizations are doing in favor of uh, pushing some type of political narrative. Most of these people, most of the people that are calling for some type of significant change tend to live in cities well disconnected from the natural world. And that, in my humble opinion, is the problem. We, as humans in the first world, have become so disconnected from the natural world in our minds that we feel that we can apply human characteristics or human feelings and emotions to things that are much bigger. The fact of the matter is, well, you look pretty much every wild animal, with the possible exception of grizzly bears, runs when they see humans. It is so ingrained in our DNA that we are part of their ecosystem and their top predator that even grizzly bears run in our presence. So we are ingrained in the ecosystem. We are a part of the ecosystem. We're not something that is separate. You say that humans are encroaching upon the, the, the homes and ecosystem of animals, but it's our home too. You know, the Native Americans and natives of all cultures existed in, in, in fair harmony with nature and the wildlife there. They harvested respectfully and uh, responsibly, and they set healthy boundaries. Yeah, some atta animal attacks occur. And that's always going to be the case because we're dealing with wild animals. But what we've lost is that sense of belonging and balance that comes from immersing yourself in nature. The more I spend time in nature, the more I see the balance. I see how one aspect of the natural world complements another, you know. You know, to simplify it, it's the circle of life. 
but we are a part of that as well. We're not something that's separate from it. So my passion project and my focus at this point in my life is on what I consider be, to be the biggest threat to the balance of our ecosystem. And that is apex predator management. Um, first and foremost, I will say without a doubt, I believe that wolves, grizzly bears, cougars, coyotes, bobcats, lynx, wolverine, I believe that all of them belong in our ecosystems. I do not want to see them gone any way, shape, or form. I support reintroduction programs and, uh, and, um, and programs that are, that are trying to boost the numbers of animals that are endangered or at risk. Uh, that's, that's not what I want or any hunters want. We don't want to see these animals disappear from our landscapes. What we want is the ability to effectively manage them. And any good forest management or live or, or wildlife management program has to include a good apex predator management program as well. We are not in the early 1800s. There are simply not enough hunters and not enough hunters that are targeting apex predators. And, and when I say hunters, I'm including trapping, trapping as well. There's not enough hunters or trappers that are targeting apex predators to really have much of a, a significant um, uh, effect on the population. Populations are high for a lot of animals in the western states. So Oregon, Idaho, Washington, California, Montana, cougar populations are through the roof. Uh, in Idaho, wolf populations are, are outrageous. In Washington, wolf and Oregon, wolf populations are growing exponentially uh, to the point that there is going to be a problem soon. So while I want these animals in our ecosystem, I feel that the ecosystem needs them. We need to maintain and have the tools to effectively manage them. From my perspective, hunting and trapping are a couple of those tools, but because hunting and trapping in and of itself is not going to affect the population, uh, we need to look at other avenues that I'm calling abatement. So while these animal populations are high, what they've done, because they have not been pursued in so long, in, in Washington, for instance, in 19, uh, 1996, you know, hound hunting for, for and baiting for cougars and bears was outlawed. And it is what it is. I'm not going to, to, to cast judgment on that decision, but what it's done is created as we are now three or four generations past that for bears and cougars, it's created a situation where the animals don't fear us. Oh, I went out with uh, Bart George, Bruce Duncan, and Jeff Flood on um, the Kalispells Tribe's cougar, I'm calling it the Cougar Conditioning or Cougar Harassment Project. And before they harassed the cat, after collaring it, they got some control data. And they walked a pup on these cats with a speaker at 80 decibels playing human talking sounds. And when they did that, the first time the cat let them, it, it spooked at maybe 100 yards. And then they walked out. And the next time, a couple weeks later, they did it again. And the cat spooked at like 60 yards or so. And they walked out. And the third time the cat let them walk to within 11 yards of them. And what that shows is because that human interaction didn't have any negative reinforcement, that these cougars are now let, now comfortable. They're safe uh, around people. And so they don't have a fear from us. They really don't need to have a fear from us, <laughs> of, uh, of us, especially if we're not hunting them. Uh, 
conversely, <laughs> when they actually started adding the negative, the, the negative stimulation uh, of being chased by dogs up a tree, then the cougars responded completely the opposite. So the first time and I went out with them, and these videos are on my YouTube page, but the first time I went out with them, the, the cougar spooked at 60 yards and then ran about 65 yards. And then we released the dogs, chased it up a tree, and left. The second time, this cougar spooked at 122 yards and ran 340 yards to get away. And again, we then released the dogs, chased it, and chased it and up a tree, and then left. And then the third time, we went out and the cougar spooked to the human talking sounds at 220 yards and then ran another 300 plus yards away to get away before we we uh, released the dogs and put it up a tree and then tranquilized it and removed its collar as it is giving us the information that we needed. But it's showing that these non-fatal but negative interactions uh, harassment or hazing uh, of these cougars will can and does have a positive effect on them. And so while hunting is not the answer to control the population, what we can do is change these animals' behaviors so we see less predation and, uh, and depredation because they don't feel comfortable around human establishments. You know, as much as I love wolves, we have, a, we have a big storm brewing, and wolf is, um, it's, it's much greater than itself. If anybody's watched the, the, the video on Yellowstone about how the wolves change the river, then they understand how, how big of an impact that wolf can have on, on uh, at an ecosystem. Not just the, flora, the fauna in the ecosystem, but the flora and the ecosystem's health as well. And so, but right now what we have is we have a significantly high population of wolves in Idaho that are wreaking havoc on the ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, in, in the years that, that they've allowed hunting of them and trapping of them, the populations have grown. The hunting and trapping is not having an effect on the population. Uh, it's maybe slowing the growth slightly, but the population is still growing. Wolves are smart, and they are the hardest animal in North America to hunt or trap, flat out. Um, and so, as this population has grown, there's more and more instances of, of uh, livestock depredation and, uh, and pets being killed. And what we want to do is we want to try to find a balance to manage that population in such a way that we see less of those uh, instead of more and more of them. In uh, in Washington and Oregon, we have a growing wolf population. And if we look at studies again in Yellowstone, when, uh, when, uh, when the wolf population got established in Yellowstone, the cougar population dropped by about 68%, which sounds like a good thing. It's, you know, we're still dealing with the, the wolves, but the problem is how that happened. So that happened because the wolves displaced the animals that the cougars were primarily feeding on. They displaced them because those animals were more afraid of the wolves than they were of predation by cougars. And because of that, um, what you end up with is, a, is most of that population reduction was due to starvation. Those cats starved to death and when cougars get to that point where they're starving, then they become dangerous to human, to livestock, and to people. They're not particularly dangerous otherwise, except for when they're in a situation where they're, they're, they're looking at starvation. And so for Oregon and Washington, as our wolf population grows and as the prey for the cougars, which are at epidemically high levels, starts to to be pushed out of the normal areas that the cougars hunt what we're going to start seeing is we're going to see a, a larger number of uh of cougar depredation calls and uh and these are animals we have a, a large volume of of cougars and then we have a large volume of starving cougars 
that aren't afraid of people anymore and that routinely let people walk within 20 to 30 feet of them. And then we're so, so potentially we were looking at, at a lot more human predation as well, or human attacks as well. And so, you know, we're really at a, at a crux time where this is a really important time. And at the same time, we're seeing all this legislation of people wanting to, to, to res further restrict the, the ability to manage these apex predators, and not just for hunters and trappers, but for even law enforcement agencies and fish and wildlife agencies. And it's alarming that a lot of this is coming internally from our, the commissions of our fish and wildlife agencies, ignoring the data that their biologists are doing and the high volume of calls that even their, their wildlife conflict specialists are dealing with on a daily basis. And they're tr still trying to further restrict our ability to manage these apex predators. And that's a huge problem. It's a problem for anybody that lives more than 20 miles from, from I-5 in Oregon, Washington, or California. If you live in these cities and urban areas and don't deal with it, I can see, and that's where the most of our population based in these states live, but I can see how you don't see it. And, and if you're not an outdoorsy person that, that is connected, I, don't, I, I can see that you don't see the high numbers of depredation calls and the, the, the hard work that our fish and wildlife uh, conflict specialists are doing on a daily basis, but it's happening and it's getting worse. And it is a significant issue for anybody that doesn't live within an urban area.